Recently, Ren and I watched Earwig and the Witch on HBO Max. I'd read reviews and seen a lot of comments on the film. Most of them were either indifferent or negative. Some commenters going so far as to call it an unholy eyesore for Studio Ghibli. While I try not to let comments like these create a bias in my mind or set expectations, I unfortunately went into this film with the idea that it was going to be absolutely terrible. Great! After all, I adore Studio Ghibli, and I was astounded this movie was not going to be the signature hand-drawn, charming animation that it had always been. I was turned off by the different feeling that the animation created. It was something that felt so… American. And all I wanted was the gentle escape into a different world that Ghibli was so good at doing, pulling you into Japan as though you belonged there. While I'm not nearly as critical about change as many other viewers who refuse to allow new artists and creatives to explore something they aren't used to, I couldn't help but feel nervous as we pushed play. Some thoughts that ran through my head as we were getting started. 1. Maybe I've outgrown Studio Ghibli just like I outgrew a lot of Disney. Number 2. Am I too old to watch these types of movies? And of course, number three, should I have read the book first? These questions swirled around in my mind as the opening of the movie set the scene. We start with a high-speed motorcycle chase and a woman dropping worms on the car chasing her. She shows up at an orphanage and leaves her baby with a note. I thought about how awful the animation feels, and the lips don't sync up right for the dubbing, and I wish it was Hayao's Studio Ghibli. But as the movie progressed on, the animation felt appropriate. The story was a lot of fun, and I was definitely loving Earwig's personality. We soon find out that Earwig, whom they call Erica Wig, doesn't want to be adopted and does her best to stay at the orphanage, until a very odd couple shows up and begrudgingly adopts her. We now meet Bella Yaga, a witch and her partner the Mandrake, who is intimidating and terrifying to everyone, even Bella Yaga. They take Erica home, where she is to be used as an extra set of hands and kind of like a housemaid rather than an adopted daughter. This is fine with her, as she wants to learn how to use magic in return for her services. We see a barrage of events unfold that develops the character in a charming way. No one really changes per se, but we simply get to see more of their personalities as the film goes forward. It is startling how verbatim the film is to the book. Every little detail, from Bella Yaga's mismatched eyes to the devilish facial expressions from Erica. The story is nearly exactly the same. The main creative liberty that was taken was the band plotline. In the book, Erica's mother was not mentioned after dropping her off at the orphanage. There was no written connection of the mother to Bella Yaga or the Mandrake. However, for a film, I think it was a clever way to tie everyone in together. It was also a really neat way for Goro to showcase his songwriting abilities. But now, down to the nitty gritty, there were some details that threw me off, just like everyone else. But once I detached myself from the idea that Studio Ghibli isn't allowed to try something different, I really enjoyed the movie. It was charming. The characters were engaging. Granted, they aren't extraordinarily deep, but they are fun nonetheless. And once I was reminded that the book itself is a part of the age group of my first chapter book, most engaging for ages 8 to 12, it was more understandable to have characters that are more of a stream rather than an ocean. Erica is a little girl who knows exactly what she wants, and she gets it every time. Once she's adopted, things change for her. She's receiving orders rather than giving them. And while she deals with it for a little bit, she also changes those around her into being better versions of themselves in a way. Bella Yaga, a mean old witch, is forced to soften and be held accountable for what she's promised, teaching Erica to be a witch. She is also able to soften the Mandrake. He goes from a reclusive, temperamental man to someone who shares his books with Erica and enjoys delicious food with her. In a way, she may seem like a terror, but she brings out the best in those around her. This could also include one of my favorite characters, the black cat familiar, Thomas. Maybe I'm a little biased for a cute black cat, but Thomas was a fun character. He is afraid of Bella Yaga and often hides behind the big gross cauldron. When Erica was especially upset, she was trying to draw mean pictures of Bella Yaga and the Mandrake. She noticed her walls starting to warp. Thomas unexpectedly tells her it is the Mandrake who's upset with her drawing. This startles her because no one knew Thomas could talk. I mean, for any adult viewer who has seen a Disney movie before knows that 9 out of 10 times the animal is going to talk. But for the age group that this film was intended for, this is a fun and exciting little surprise. As a character, Thomas is cute, smart, and the one that pushes Erica to develop as a character. 
He takes her to the workroom and shows her how to cast her very first spell. He eggs her on for the rest of the film as to how she can get what she wants. He becomes her likable sidekick. This is in both the movie and the book. Now the book is definitely for children, there's no doubt about it. It has a simple plot, simple characters, and a simple ending. It is intended to be about the ride, not the outcome. The reader, and even in the film, the viewer, is really just along for the ride. It doesn't need to be a big spectacular ending. We see Erica, not wanting to leave the only home she's ever known, get adopted into a home she doesn't really fit into, and then we watch as all of the characters grow to care about each other. This is really all we need. The book, I think, is great for what it is. The film is wholesome and clever and a fresh take for Goro Miyazaki. I think the reason most people didn't like the movie is because of a present expectation for Goro to do everything exactly as his father did. When in reality, he's a creator. He has a vision, and it just so happens to be different from Hayao's. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love Hayao Miyazaki. I think he's a stunningly brilliant creator with a vision that simply cannot be replicated. So to expect Goro to replicate his father I think is insulting not only to Hayao, but to Goro as well. Much like the transitional changes with any entertainment industry, we need to wait for the Hayao fans to either accept the new Studio Ghibli or move on to something else to allow the new generation to fall in love with Goro. Goro has learned from his mistakes, straying too far from the source material. He literally made the story by Diana Wynne-Jones come to life nearly exactly as she had written it. There were creative liberties with including the music element and that having the mother return at the end, but I honestly don't think it was as terrible as many people said. My only complaint is that it ended so abruptly. I was so invested in the characters and the story that I simply wanted to see more, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Let me know what you thought of how the book lined up with the movie in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like the video and subscribe. Join us on our Facebook page if you haven't already for memes, news, and sneak peeks into popcorn. Toodles!